Please stand with me. We're going to be in Revelation chapter 21, the end of the book. We, are going through, we have been going through a series of the seven seas of history, which has coincided with the VBS theme. And I get to capstone another series for you guys. So here we go. Revelation chapter 21. I'm going to be focusing my message on verses 1 through 4, but I will be reading um, a few more passages in Revelation 22 as well. So Revelation 21, 1 through 4, starting there. This is the word of the Lord. It says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. I'm now going to skip to chapter 22, verses 1 through 5. So read along with me a page ahead. Chapter 22 says, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, through the middle of the street of the city. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. And then finally, I'm going to skip down to verse 16 and read to the end of the scriptures. Verse 16 of chapter 22 says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright and morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come, and let the one who hears say, come, and let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city which are described in this book. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. Please be seated. And as we go to his word, please pray with me one final time that the Lord would be present and that he would speak through me, that you wouldn't just hear from me. Lord, we just thank you for your word, God. We thank you that we know the end of the story. God, help us to be encouraged, to be convicted, to be transformed by your word this morning as I cannot do anything other than speak. It has to be you, Holy Spirit, who does the work. Jesus, we are elated and excited to be with you one day. Impress upon our hearts and our minds the joy that awaits us. I ask all of these things in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. So we're going to focus in on verses 1 through 4 of chapter 21. So lately it seems that I can't get away from ending sermon series is, and today is no exception. If you remember, two months ago, I got to end the series on the Sermon on the Mount. But with VBS happening a few weeks ago now, and us going through the seven C's of history, which really is his story, history, I get to try to capstone the wonderful plan of redemption with a zeroing in on our final destination at home. But I'm also excited to share this final C with you because it's one I think we don't dwell on or think about, as, about nearly as often as we should. In fact, 
I think we tend to spend a little bit too much time on the specific events that will lead up to the final C, to the detriment of our own joy, peace, and well-being. But don't get me wrong, I'm not one of those Christians who thinks we should not care about, what, about the things that are go down here on this earth and the detailed events that live leading up to the final C. I'm not that kind of person. Which, by the way, the final C is consummation. We sang about it in that one, the church is one foundation hymn. It literally said that in there. Um, but I think we, in fact, I think we should care a great deal about the end of where we're going to be one day, mostly because uh, we were left down here with a purpose, with this thing called the Great Commission. It's not like we don't have things to do down here while we wait to get there. But I do want to keep things in balance um, because I think we can get a little tunnel visioned, if I'm honest, in our minds, in our hearts' attentions uh, to the point of discouragement, anxiety, pessimism, and sometimes, if we're honest, despair as Christians. Because we see the world around us. We see all the strife, all the wars, all the evil, all the suffering, all the pain, right? I think, you know, obviously, the main reason is because we live our current reality in this thing and are inundated by this thing called the curse of sin. It's ever-present. It's our companion. And we feel its consequences daily. It's effects like war, disease, cancer, broken relationships, divorce, murder, accidents, sexual immorality in all of its forms, greed for money and power, and injustice in all, impact us all. To the point where it can affect our spiritual mindset, our spiritual lens, as it were, to how we should be facing our every day and our day-to-day in this present life. And we all have to fight to see clearly from time to time, do we not? So this, in the spirit of the Apostle Paul, I hope we can reach the point to where he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen, Because he says that the things that are seen are transient or temporary, but the things that are unseen are eternal. That's what I'm hoping to do and focus on this morning, is to get our eyes off of the present circumstances, not be like an ostrich with our head in the sand per se, but to really have our emphasis and focus and gaze on Jesus and our home and what is waiting for us, like Paul says. It's not the things that we go through here in this life don't compare to what awaits. Amen? Amen? That's the point of my message. And no matter where you uh, land in regards to the end times or things leading up to the end times, no matter where you land on any of that, and believe me, there's probably different views represented here in this room, I want us to, at the very least, use Colossians chapter 3, 1 through 4 as kind of a, a heart exercise. When in Colossians 3, he says, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things of the earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And listen to this, it says in verse 4, when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So the scripture t- clearly tells us to focus on what awaits us, not so much to get focused on the here and the now to the detriment of our joy, right? So let me review really quick the zoomed out picture of redemption, the whole entire history uh, picture here. We have creation where God started with, by his word, creating everything that is in existence in the universe. Plants, animals, mountains, seas, oceans, insects, Lizards, spiders, mosquitoes. I don't know why he would do that, but he did. But at the pinnacle of his creation, he creates us, man, in his own image. And because he gives us his own image, he gives us uh, dominion over the rest of creation. He institutes uh, this thing called marriage. He creates Eve out of the rib from Adam. He creates um, just this relationship that we get to have with the Lord. Adam walked with the Lord in the garden, right? And he puts him in the garden to work it and till it. So he gives us the gift of work. 
We don't think of it as such, but it is a gift. Work is a gift. We have a purpose. But guess what? We screwed it up. Adam screwed it up. He, he rebelled. They rebelled. They both were deceived by the serpent. They, he uh, twisted the view of God that they had. Think, and Adam and Eve thought that God was holding out on them for something. You will be like God knowing good and evil. And they're like, okay, I want to be like, I want to know good and evil. So they took apart of the temptation. They fell into it. And obviously it brought upon us this thing called the curse of sin. And from there we have all that we see in all of human history, the death, the destruction, the havoc that we wreak. And creation is even put under the same. It's funny how the creation order, the consequences that happen to it is directly tied to our rebellion against the creator. And then we see the, the catastrophe of the flood. How God wants to restart with Noah and his family yet gives them mercy in the ark, a way, the only way of salvation, a foreshadowing of things to come. He gives them a restart. After that, they multiply, fill the earth, and then they try to come together again and build a tower to heaven. That's confusion. In the Tower of Babel, we know the story. Their, their pride got to them. They tried to lift their name high and stiff-arm God, the creator, once again. And he, can, he came down. Funny how they were trying to reach up, but he's the one that came down. And he confused their language. We see human history kind of go further from that to the point where finally the promised one, the anointed one, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, comes on the scene. And he is the only way for salvation that is offered. And the people that he came to in that moment, many of them missed it. His own people he came to and his own did not receive them. But to them who called upon his name, he gave the right to become children of God, the scripture says. And he died upon that cross, took our punishment, took the curse that was on us upon himself and made a way. Amen. And so now we see him die and get raised to life by God the Father and he's now ascended into heaven. And this leads to our seventh C, consummation. Consummation implies the idea of closure, of finality to something that has gone on for a while and is now being wrapped up in its entirety. You know, Russ and I were joking because the songs for VBS, they had that Seven Seas song. And uh, it's like, you, you, they get stuck in your head. If you've ever been to a VBS and you sing the songs for more than two days, they always get stuck in your head. And we were saying like, yeah, I don't know if I really want this song stuck in my head because then you sing the one line, consummation, it is the last seat. And it's, you don't really want people to hear you say that in public because then they're going to look at you weird and be like, what is he talking about consummation like that for? What is going on in that church? But God doesn't leave us with a cliffhanger ending of the chapter. No, he gives us the end of the story, which I'm so thankful that he does this because guess what? Like we just sang, we know how the story ends. We will be with him again. That is encouraging news. Now, here's the thing. We still live in this world where we see both good and bad. St sin still has a hold and we must struggle against even our own sinful desires. But if we are in Christ, we have been set free from the bondage of sin. We have been forgiven of our trespasses, our penalty. And we have a relationship with God and we have a hope and the hope of living forever in heaven with him. But God's still not yet done. The end is yet to come. So really, the Christian life that we all currently live in is really just a suspension between the already, but not yet. And that's frustrating. That's frustrating to me in a sense. And I have to stop and, and, and just calm my heart because I'm not patient. I don't know about you, but I'm not patient. Patience is something I struggle with. And patience can be a good and bad thing, right? Like, have you ever... Um, waited for something that you're super excited to have happen or to get. And you're like, I can't wait for this to happen. I can't wait. This is going to be amazing. Why can't it happen yesterday? Lord, why can't you come back like three weeks ago, 10 years ago, whatever it might be? Lord, come on, come quickly. And that is a good thing. It's a positive way to try to be patient, I guess. And even creation waits for the consummation of all things in the passage that I read at the beginning of the service in Romans 8. But waiting for so long can sometimes conjure up things like doubt 
or complaining, right? If we're honest with ourselves, we're like, why is he taking so long? Is he really going to come through on his promises like he said? When is it going to happen? And Peter, the, the uh, apostle Peter, he encourages us with those of us who are doubting and impatient. In 2 Peter 3, 8 and 9, you don't have to turn there, but it says this, but do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as with one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. So even in his waiting, it's actually his mercy. Think about the flood one, for once a moment again. It took Noah 120 years to build that ark. And, and Hebrews describes Noah as a preacher of righteousness. So he had 120 years, Noah did, preaching the gospel of come into this ark, as it were, and you will be saved, you and your household. Not one convert, but the Lord's patience was meant to lead those people to repentance. Fast forward again to right now. Now is the window of salvation that we are given. Today is the day of salvation. We don't have tomorrow. It's not promised. And so if you are in the boat of, I don't think I've really placed my faith and trust in Christ, today is your day. Last week, the master's voice, Ricky, stood up here and he talked about John 6, and he talked about how we're not promised tomorrow in the same spirit, if you are doubting whether you know that you know that you know that you're going to be with him one day in heaven, make that something you, you prioritize in your heart and put your faith and your trust in your whole salvation and your life in Jesus and in Jesus alone. I love what Jesus says in John 14. Again, you don't have to turn there, but he again encourages his disciples. He says, let not your hearts be troubled. To his disciples, believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go and prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. That's encouragement. Sometimes we need those intimate words from Jesus himself to our hearts, that though we are here in this present life, and though we are going through trials and struggles, we, we, we have to look to his promise and to his character that he's still good, that he's still faithful, that he's still loving. I know that I need that. This kind of leads me to my favorite verse, actually, in the whole entire Bible. It's Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. Again, you don't have to turn there necessarily, but write it down maybe and read it later. But I'm going to go through it really quick for us. Titus chapter 2, 11 through 14 says this. Listen closely. It says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. And we've gone over that. Verse 11 really just talks about God's grace, which has appeared. This is talking about who? Christ. It's talking about Jesus. His first coming. His first appearance. Continuing on, it says in verse 12, it, The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives when? In the present age. Jesus, in his example, and through his Holy Spirit that he has now given to us, it's that spirit in us, if we've put our faith and trust in Christ, that trains us or teaches us to say no to ungodliness and to worldly passions, but to live in stealth, self-controlled upright and godly in the right here and the right now. Here's a question. How self-controlled are you in saying no to worldly passions, believer? What are some worldly passions that you get tempted by and may have to say no to? We all are different in our different struggles and our different battles, internal sinful desires, things like that. We just went over our Sermon on the Mount series. Maybe Maybe what you need to do today is to actually re-examine your heart and go through that exam in the Sermon on the Mount and all the areas that it covers and to see where you are with these things. But don't put off living 
uh, righteously thinking to yourself, I have time to get right with the Lord. You don't know when he's coming back. Even for a believer, I said unbelievers, you don't know when he's coming back and your window of salvation is here. But even for the believers, you still don't know when he's coming back exactly. And for the believer, Luke 12, 35 through 37 talks about this. It says, stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning. So you're not off the hook, Christian. And be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. And it says, blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Are we awake? Are you awake? And then finally, in verses 13 and 14 of Titus 2, Paul, he says we are waiting for a blessed hope. The Bible doesn't use the word hope like we use the word. Most of the time when we use the word hope, it really has this connotation of I wish something will come about. In the Bible, though, it's not that way at all. Hope means that we know something will happen. It is a patient expectation based in trust in the promises of God and his character. And that's why in so much of my Christian life, I focus solely on the character of God because when all else fails, I know that he won't fail. And he is my hope. And although there are differing views on how exactly we get to the events of Jesus' return will play out, there are certain things that we know are beyond dispute wherever you may land in the eschatological framework of things, right? And I'm going to just go over a few of them here right now. Number one, we know that Jesus' return will be in bodily form at a time that no one knows but the Father to judge both the living and the dead who will be resurrected in bodily form. It says this in Matthew 24, 36 through 39. It talks about the suddenness of his return. In Matthew 25, 31 through 34, it talks about the sheep and the goats being separated and that the kingdom will be given to the sheep. Number two, those who are in Christ will inherit eternal life, but unbelievers will be consigned to a place of torment called the lake of fire, which is an eternal state of abandonment from God along with the devil and his angels. And that's not something to be, you know, we have so many caricatures of hell and the devil with, you know, horns and a, and a pitchfork tail and, and that kind of, no, it's, it's, I think that the basic definition of hell really from what the scriptures talk about is a true abandonment for God forever. Because God is all good, right? Everything good is encapsulated in the person of God and Jesus. And when you're separated from that eternally, that is hell. If you remember on the cross when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus, in that moment, when he said those words to his father, that was hell for him. He went to hell for you if you have placed your faith and trust in Jesus. So if you haven't done that, or those who won't do that, their hell is preserved for them, unfortunately. And I pray, and the Lord prays as we read, that he desires none should perish, but that you will take a hold of the gospel and of Jesus who has taken the punishment for you if you put your faith in that. Roman, or Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15, I have to read this. Just go a page back in your Bibles with me for one minute. In verses 11 through 15 of chapter 20, it talks about judgment before the great white throne. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. Then another book was opened, the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the, the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. You know, it reminds me kind of of Luke chapter 10, verse 20, when Jesus, if you remember with me, he sends, sends out his disciples two by two. He says, take no extra cloak, take one pair of sandals, take a staff and go to each city, proclaiming that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he says, if they accept you, stay in that house. But if they don't, 
wipe the dust off your feet and leave that town, right? And he says, I'm giving you authority to cast out demons in my name and to do all these miraculous signs and wonders. And then the disciples come back to Jesus after they go out two by two and they say pretty much, Lord, we have the authority to cast out demons in your name. This is amazing. Like I could just imagine the disciples being so psyched out and excited about the fact that they're like, oh my gosh, this actually worked. He gave us the authority and I actually did that. I casted out a demon. And then Jesus' response, I marvel at it. It's so interesting and fascinating to me. He says in verse 20 of chapter 10, Jesus says, Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice in what? That your names are written or registered in heaven. Again, I have to stop here. Are your names written in the book of life? Finally, we're going to get to Revelation 21 and 22, where God gives us a glimpse or a vision of the restoration he promises. So let's go there. Verses 1 through 4, I'm going to read one more time. We have a few minutes to go through this. It says this, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And when I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. I love this passage. Let's get into it a little bit. First of all, it says, the new heavens and the new earth. When I first heard this as a Christian, I was like, what does this mean, new heavens and the new earth? Because we hear about the fact that, well, in the scripture, the, the earth is going to be destroyed by fire and there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth. I think 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 through 12 give us a, a little bit of a, a more detailed snapshot. So I'm going to read it for us. But the new heavens and the new, new earth say that it talks about this in, it in this way. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief and the heavens will, be, will pass away with a roar. And the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved. That's kind of crazy. And the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. That's a scary thought, if I might say. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. That sounds like a great thing, honestly. This earth, I'm so tired of it. I'm tired of this earth, but I'm tired more so I think of my own flesh. I'm so tired of what I do. You know, Romans chapter 7, Paul talks about the fact that he's like, I, I do the things I don't want to do, and the things I don't want to do, I still do, do them. Wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of death? Well, Jesus is. And this is what we have to look forward to. New heavens and a new earth. And then in Revelation 20, 21, it says, And I saw a holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Question, what is this city? What is this new Jerusalem? Or maybe, maybe, a better question would be, who makes up this city? The Bible talks about three illustrations, and we kind of sung about them already in our hymns and songs, but the Bible talks about three main illustrations that it uses to describe the Greek fun term here, ekklesia, now you can say that I'm smart, ekklesia, or it really means in Greek, the called out ones. It gives us three illustrations, the body, the building, and the bride. Like how I did that alliteration, three Bs. First one, body, in Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to go through these semi-quick. The body of Christ, but it says in 1 Corinthians 12, but as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. And it says in Colossians that Christ is the head of the body, the church. Second illustration is it, it's a building. Okay, so here's the a, here's a thing. When I go home to Ohio, to Cleveland, and I talk about faith community church, am I talking about a structure made of 
building materials like concrete, wood, wiring, drywall, roofing? Is that what I'm referring to when I say faith community is awesome? I'm so glad the Lord brought Sarah and I to this place. Of course I'm not. No, that's ludicrous. When I talk about this place, I'm talking about you. All of you individuals and families who make up this place called Faith Community Church. There's nothing special about brick and mortar that's being built, but when all the people from the surrounding towns, and there are many represented in this body, when we all come together, united, under one banner, under one purpose, under one goal, at one time, kind of like tonight, or this morning, not tonight, that's what makes this place special. 1 Peter 2, 4 and 5 says, As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious. You yourselves are like living stones that are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So we are his body, we are his building, we are his church, as it were, obviously. And lastly, uh, before I get to the last one, the bride, I do want to say that in Revelation, it's upgraded to a city. It's not just a building, it's a city, though. And Abraham and the Old Testament saints, they had the foresight to see that this must not be all there is. They had, by faith, the foresight to see what was to come in some shadow vision that they saw. In Hebrews chapter 11 and 12, it talks about Abraham. You don't need to turn there. But it says in Hebrews 11, by faith, Abraham, he went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. What was he, what is that talking about? I believe it's talking about the new Jerusalem. I believe it's talking about the church, a people that God will make for his own possession from every tribe, language, tongue, and nation. Again, and a little bit further down, it says Abraham and Sarah had been thinking of the land for which they had gone out. They would have had the opportunity to return, but as it is, they desired a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Finally, the bride. In Ephesians, it talks about husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water of the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. That's the picture we get here in Revelation 21, as a, a bride adorned for her husband. That's the personification of this. And finally, in the last few minutes, though, I really, really do want to hit the pinnacle of this message is in verses 3 and 4 of Revelation 24, or 21, sorry. Let me just read those one more time. Verse 3 says, And I heard a loud voice saying from the throne, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. At the end of the day, all the amazing things that we have to look forward to in heaven, whether it be the streets of gold, the mansions, the new heavens and the new earth, judging angels, ruling and reigning as co-heirs with Christ, all of those things are great, right? Like, that's what we sing about, that's what we talk about, that's what we have to look forward to. However, I think the best part about heaven is what is declared in verses 3 and 4. Namely, God is there. He will be amongst us fully and finally. We will see him, talk with him, feel him, hear his voice audibly, we will get to know him and him us. In other words, intimacy. Is that not what you want? Is that not what was at the beginning? And then when we fell, that was the thing that was severed? 
And now we have come full circle. Christ is restoring all things to be very good again, perfect in fact. And now he's not even going to let us mess it up again himself. He's kind of made that way. And he's, you know, those who are his are his forever. But don't you want that intimacy with our Lord and our Savior? Don't you want to see him when your faith shall become sight? Isn't that not something that gets you up in the morning? We, we run on worship. That's the fuel in our hearts. That's the purpose for why we were created, for worship. And here on this earth, those of us who don't know Christ or those who don't know Christ, they try to, they, they try to put things in their heart that won't actually ultimately fulfill because they've been only created for one thing, and that's to worship the creator. They put love in different forms in their hearts, thinking that it will satisfy, and it doesn't. But we as Christians, we have that love. We have that hope. We have that future. It's not a wish. It's a guarantee. If the main thing... And, and like I say, and I emphasize main thing, not the only thing, but if the main thing that you were excited about when we get to glory isn't what verses three and four talk about, then I'm sorry, but you've probably missed the whole point of the entire Bible. That's a crazy statement, but I think it's true. I believe that because paradise is restored Yes, I'm excited that God's enemies and our enemies are gone forever. Yes, I'm excited that justice is done to all the wrongdoings that have happened in my life and all the lives of everyone in this room. Of course we want justice. Yes, I'm excited that I'm no longer in the presence of sin, but I will be made holy. Yes, I'm excited to see loved ones who I know were waiting for me, but the thing I'm most excited for is seeing my Savior face to face and feeling his embrace. I hope that's you. I hope that's your heartbeat. That's mine. And that's what I wanted to try to do this morning is to get our eyes on Jesus. It says, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of what his glory and his grace. There's a reason why we sing that. There's a reason why we come together and we sing these songs and listen to his word is because we want him. He's the answer and he's the treasure. That's it. All the other is just, all the other perks are just, just the cherry on top. And again, I'll just read the natural outflow of what this intimacy will bring in verses 4. He will wipe every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any fo- anymore for the former things have passed away. Now, finally, just really quick, I want to just say what will not be there because a city or a country or a border, it has a purpose. It's to keep out the bad and keep in the good. And unfortunately, in our country, we have a great example of what that shouldn't look like. That's all I'll say. But in Revelation 21, 27, look with me there. It says, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, the city of God, the heavenly Jerusalem, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. And then finally, chapter 22, verses 3 through 5 say this. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads and night will be no more. They will need no light of the lamp or sun for the Lord God will be their light and they will reign forever and ever. I want to end with the lyrics of a a song that I I just couldn't stop singing in my heart and in my head as I prepared for this message. And there were so many good songs that we've already sung. But let me share with you just one more. It's literally called The Hymn of Heaven by Phil Wickham. And the words go like this. How I long to breathe the air of heaven, where pain is gone and mercy fills the streets, to look upon the one who bled to save me and walk with him for all eternity. There will be a day when all will bow before him. There will be a day when death will be no more, standing face to face with he who died and rose again. Holy, holy is the Lord. Verse two says, and every prayer We prayed in desperation the songs of faith we sang through doubt and fear. In the end, we'll see that it was worth it when he returns to wipe away our tears. And then finally, the crescendo. And on that day, 
we join the resurrection and stand beside the heroes of the faith and with one voice, a thousand generations sing, worthy is the lamb who was slain, forever he shall reign. So let it be today, we shout the hymn of heaven. With angels and the saints, we raise a mighty roar. Glory to our God who gave us life beyond the grave. Holy, holy is the Lord. Please pray with me as I close this sermon. Lord, we just thank you for your word, God, and the promises that you give in it. Jesus, we have a home that is being prepared for us currently. Yet we live in the right here and the right now. But as the song I just recited is encouraging us to do, let it be today that we can shout the hymn of heaven. That one day we will be with the saints and the angels as a thousand generations singing, worthy, worthy, worthy is the lamb who was slain. Lord, and the best part about what we have to look forward to is to see you faith, face to face. Lord, help us today Help us this week. Help us in the coming months and years, however long we are on this side of heaven and all of the various trials that we, like Paul, can say this light and momentary affliction is not worth to be compared to the glory that awaits. Help us, Lord. We are feeble and we are weak in our humanness. Father, we need your spirit to encourage every day to walk with us now in the already but not yet. Jesus, thank you for giving us your church, the community of believers by which we can walk life with every day. Let, let us not take the community of believers for granted. Help us not to take this, what we are doing this morning for granted. We love you and we thank you for who you are, what you've done and what you will do, Lord. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.